the last ratio which we were able to solve in the previous video of this lecture series is this receivables turnover of 17.07 times. Using this ratio now to divide the number of working days in a year, we get the average age of receivables. Assuming 360 working days in a year, the average age of receivables is 21 days. This ratio, which is also known as average collection period, day sales outstanding, or number of day sales in receivables, is useful in evaluating an entity's credit and collection policies as it indicates the average number of days during which the company must wait before receivables are collected. Meaning to say, for Elizabeth Tailoring Materials Store, from the time it makes a sale on account, it takes 21 days on average before it is able to collect that account's receivable. The lesser or the smaller the average age of receivables is, the better. Nonetheless, to make analysis of this ratio really meaningful, it must be compared with the entity's credit terms. If the average age of receivables is shorter than the credit terms, the ratio would be quite acceptable. For instance, if Elizabeth Tailoring Materials Store extends 30-day credit terms to customers, this 21 days average age of receivables or average collection period may be considered something positive because it means that the company is able to collect its receivables within the credit period given to customers. However, if the average age of receivables is longer than the credit terms, it may indicate a poorly managed credit department or collection department or both. For example, the company extends 15-day credit terms to customers. This 21 days average collection period means that the entity collects its receivables late beyond the credit period of 15 days. And hence, it is not a good sign. The entity's credit department may be lax or not careful in determining the ability of its customers to pay their obligations. And hence, cause it to approve the granting of credit to undeserving customers or the entity's collection department may be at fault, not being able to do something to collect its receivables on time, or both the credit department and the collection department are to be blamed. Aside from this formula, there is another way to compute for the average age of receivables although the answer may sometimes be not exactly the same. That is, accounts receivable divided by the net credit sales per day. In the entity's statement of financial position as of December 31, 2022, its net accounts receivable amount to 670000 while its income statement shows net sales during the year of 12,120,000. Now, let's place those figures here. Notice, however, that what we need as denominator is not the net credit sales for the year but the average net credit sales per day. Therefore, we need to divide this 12,120,000 net credit sales for the year 2022 by 360 days. 
to get the daily average of 33,666.67. Just like what you learned in a previous lesson, we use 360 days as the standard number of days in a year, not 365 days. 670,000 pesos divided by 33,666.67 equals 20 days average age of receivables. Which, if you notice, is one day less than our answer of 21 days using this first formula. That means, as I mentioned, there could be a small difference in the answer when we use another formula. But then, that is not a problem. Either answer is acceptable. The difference may be considered negligible, insignificant. In case you want to ask me which formula you should use, the first or the second, my answer is, it depends on your teacher or on the textbook you are using or it depends on the given information in the problem. Better yet, I advise you to know both formulas. That's the reason why I discuss the two formulas. Another ratio which may be considered as both liquidity ratio and activity ratio is inventory turnover because it measures the activity or liquidity of an entity's inventory. This ratio indicates the efficiency of inventory management and measures the number of times on average inventory is replaced during the period. It is computed by dividing the cost of sales or cost of goods sold by the average inventory. It is important to point out that this formula is applicable for a merchandising concern business. For a manufacturing business which carries three major types of inventories, namely raw materials, goods in process or work in process and finished goods, a turnover figure is computed for each inventory type. For raw materials turnover, the formula is cost of raw materials used divided by the average raw materials inventory. For goods in process turnover, the formula is cost of goods manufactured divided by the average goods in process inventory. While for finished goods turnover, it's cost of goods sold divided by the average finished goods inventory. From the name of the turnover ratio, we get an idea about its denominator. Raw materials turnover, so the denominator must be average raw materials inventory. Goods in process turnover. So the denominator must be average goods in process inventory. Finish goods turnover. Therefore, the denominator must be the average finish goods inventory. Raw materials must be used in the production of goods. Hence, the numerator, cost of raw materials used. Goods in process must be continued to be manufactured for them to become finished products. Therefore, the numerator, cost of goods manufactured. Once the goods are finished, they are then sold. Hence, the cost of goods sold as the numerator for this Type of ratio, finished goods turnover. 
going back to this formula for a merchandising business like Elizabeth Tailoring Materials Store, just like the other ratios I've discussed so far, please realize how easy it should be for you to keep this formula in mind. From the name of the ratio, inventory turnover, it should be obvious that the denominator must be the inventory. Only use the average, average inventory figure. I discussed the use of average in part 2 of this lecture series. Remember? How about the numerator? How can we easily remember that the numerator must be the cost of sales or cost of goods sold? Simple. Just recall one lesson you learned before, which I elaborated in the video about periodic system and perpetual system. When merchandise inventory is sold, the asset merchandise inventory becomes an expense. Specifically, what kind of expense? Cost of sales or cost of goods sold. That's why the numerator must be cost of sales. When inventory is sold, it becomes cost of goods sold or cost of sales. Hence, the numerator is cost of sales, cost of goods sold. Now, Elizabeth Taylor's cost of sales for 2022 is 4050000 its merchandise inventory at the beginning of that year is 1,200,000 while the ending figure stands at 950,000. One million two hundred thousand beginning inventory plus 950,000 ending inventory divided by 2 gives us the average inventory, which when used to divide the cost of sales of 4,050,000 provides us with the inventory turnover of 3.77 or 3.77 times. Because again, inventory turnover measures the number of times on average, inventory is replaced or sold during the period. Generally, the higher the inventory turnover is, the better. That is, generally speaking, because a number of factors must be taken into consideration in determining a satisfactory figure for inventory turnover. As stated earlier, the inventory turnover measures the number of times that inventory is replaced during the period. Therefore, a very high inventory turnover ratio means that it is very much possible that the inventory may run out of stock, which may result into losing some customers. On the other hand, a very low inventory turnover indicates that the entity is keeping the inventory in stock for quite a long period of time, which necessitates additional costs like storage costs, maintenance costs, and insurance costs. Another factor to consider in determining the desirable figure for inventory turnover is the nature of a company's business. Entities selling food and other perishable items as well as goods which shortly become obsolete or are highly affected by changes in style or fads like ready-to-wear clothes or even cellular phones and accessories definitely require a very high turnover ratio. Likewise, Businesses selling products with minimal markup and heavily relies on high volume sales to earn high profit 
need a very high inventory turnover ratio. On the other hand, companies selling items with high markups and or goods which are not perishable or subject to obsolescence do not need a very high inventory turnover figure. The resulting inventory turnover must likewise be compared with that of other entities in the same industry or to the entity's past inventory turnover figure. Moving forward, this inventory turnover, when used to divide the assumed number of working days in a year of 360 would provide us with the average age of inventory of 95 days. The average age of inventory indicates the average number of days during which the company must wait before inventory is sold. In other words, 95 days from the date of the purchase of inventory, Elizabeth Tailoring Materials Store expects to be able to sell that inventory. The smaller or the shorter the average age of inventory is, the better. Again, that is in general. Because other factors, like what I just discussed about the inventory turnover, must also be considered. The average age of inventory is also called average number of days sales in inventory. Moving 